So, uh, and he actually, I think he spoke here at Tesla Tech, didn't you, three years ago? Presenting uh, more or less the same ideas on gravity. I was there at that meeting. And uh, he's going to be presenting to the NPA now for the first time. And this is Art Larson. Better this way. Okay, uh, I want to thank first off uh, people from the Philosopher's Alliance for allowing me to talk here today. I want to kind of mention that it is due to the these types of meetings that we get to see other viewpoints that normally probably would never see the light of day if they were put in through a normal scientific uh, peer review. I think it's very important that meetings like this can continue on and it gives a person an idea uh, ability to bring forth thoughts that like I said it could not have come to the light of day in any other form. What I'm going to show you today is hopefully more of a nuts and bolts gravity theory. Uh, you're not going to see any formulas except for Newton's perhaps and a little modification to that. But you're going to see a way that gravity may actually work and which it could lead us into getting into interstellar space. Years ago, I went to a conference down in New York and the request for papers was entirely, almost entirely projected toward the idea that someday we're going to get into space. We want to know how to do it. And we're not talking about space such as the moon and Mars, we're talking about interstellar space. And the whole tone of the proceedings was a forward-looking, dynamic, we're going to get this thing. Well, subsequently, I have put in the abstracts and gotten requests for papers from various uh, conferences. And I've noted in the past five, six years that this drive is gone. We don't see it anymore. They're not asking us for propulsion systems. They're only asking for, can we nudge a little bit more lift capability? Can we do it cheaper? Can we get rid of the shuttle and on it off onto the American businessman, which actually has worked fairly well and hopefully will work. But the thrust is gone, and I hope that maybe with this presentation, maybe we'll reinstate some of this thrust. There are many, as has been pointed out, there are many theories of gravity. And you've got to give people credit for trying and thinking about this. But there's also a Turing test which you can do. Instead of for artificial intelligence, we can use this test, a similar test, to see if you have a viable gravitational theory. Let's assume we have, and this is a thought problem, so I can assume all this. Let's assume we have a void which has absolutely nothing in it. I mean nothing, zero, zilch, nada. And this void is the whole universe. So we're sitting there and all of a sudden the hand of God appears and he's got one atom between his fingers. And he takes that atom and he puts there in the void and then the hand disappears. All right, that little atom just sits there. There's nothing there, there's nothing no matter, no nothing whatsoever, it's purely alone. A little time goes by, and the next hand of God comes up and puts another atom next to the first one. All right, that hand disappears. If you have a viable gravitational theory, those two atoms are going to move toward each other if your theory works. If you have to have anything else other than those two atoms in that void, you do not have a viable gravitational theory. So we have Einstein, for example, that came out with curved space. He had to have space that could be bent. His theory is not a viable theory. I must admit that if you have to have other things like gravitons for your theory from the outside, 
again, it's not a viable gravitational theory. All right, now I am going to use gravitons, but we are going to find out that under the influence of these gravitons, atoms will move themselves. It's a self-movement. It's not a push, it's not an attraction, it's not bending space. The same work? All right, if we take a single atom and we put out in space, this atom is giving off gravitons. Gravitons are accepted by science as being the carrier particle of the gravitational force. How it happens, they don't know. Hopefully today we're gonna to find out how it happens. So if we have an atom in free space giving off gravitons, it's just sitting there. Now each graviton, when it starts right there at the surface, it must be going at zero speed relative to the nucleus at the time, instantaneous time of this being formed. When it is accelerated to the outside of the atomic field, by the time it hits the, the end of the atomic field, this thing is traveling at light speed, if not further. All right? And because of that tremendous acceleration, even though it is not matter, this is just a particle of radiation, because of that speed, it gives a recoil. Each graviton gives a recoil. Now that is the free invention of the human mind that Einstein talked about. This is the one assumption that I have made to leapfrog into this gravitational theory. Okay? How do we get this thing to go up? There we go. Here what I'm trying to show is uh, two atoms. The graviton from one atom comes up and hits the other one and sets up a vortex. And when it sets up a vortex, the gravitons that should have been emitted right here during the time that the energy of this graviton is being absorbed into that nucleus, these gravitons that should have been emitted can't be emitted, so the ones that are going off the backsides have their recoils unbalanced. That gives this atom a net movement in the down direction. The same way it happens when this thing gives off gravitons but hit, hit this one, these are unbalanced and it moves this way. So we have a self-movement together and these two atoms come together and this is the gravity. By the way, I should mention that I have not seen this presentation before. We were kind of tied up and Glenn had to, or Greg had to uh, go ahead and make this without my seeing it. So there are probably a few things that I'm going to have out of sequence, but we'll yeah, try to talk about it. You had through. slide numbers, so I went by that. This is slide three. You did pretty good. <laughs> All right, here I'm showing then, oops, Ooh, that thing goes fast when you do that. Didn't you? Sorry, how did I get that thing to look down like? Go, use the middle button, it'll bring it back. All right, right here what I'm showing then is if you are, have atoms above the surface of the Earth, your gravitons from the Earth are hitting these atoms basically in the bottom side, which means the top sides are, base, are unbalanced, which means that these things then are being forced down, self-move toward the Earth, and that is what we call weight. Skip that one for a bit. Skip that one. Before I go any further, I uh, probably like, uh, this obviously didn't get into the presentation, but you all know what a skateboard is. Let's use a mechanical representation of gravity before I go any further on this. Let's assume we have two guys on a skateboard and they're facing out from each other and they each have a fire hose and they're squirting water out and that fire hose is given a tremendous recoil. So those two guys are sitting there fighting against this recoil and as long as both of them have their hoses going, that skateboard is going to stay just where it is. Now, if one of the guys decides to stop his water from flowing, that skateboard then, under the influence of the recoil from the other water, is going to go in that, that man's direction. Now let's take two skateboards, and we'll have two people shooting at each other with their water and two people shooting to the outside. 
what happens is if the middle people, one of the people, hits the other guy and knocks him off, his water stops. So that skateboard is going to come toward the first guy who's still shooting his water out. If they both get knocked off, the two skateboards are going to come together. This is a very, if we use the skateboards and say that's the atoms, if we use the water and say that's the gravitons, and the water recoil is the graviton recoil, congratulations because you just found out how gravity works. And now we have something called inertia. If, a gravi if an atom is emitting gravitons in all directions, and we take an outside force and we accelerate this atom in this direction, what's going to happen is the gravitons are going to pile up, and I'm using this to show the frequency of the emission. I should really have shown just dots. When they pile up, they're also going to pile up their, their uh, recoils. So if we shove this atom at an increasing rate, we're going to pile up more and more gravitons and more and more recoils, and we're going to get more and more initial resistance to the, the movement, the change in movement. So for example, if you try to force, if you try to uh, throw a, uh, a rock, you feel a resistance. What you're actually doing is you're piling up the gravitons of that rock and their recoils are resisting your throw. Here's the interesting thing. When I said that gravity was a self-movement, hopefully this would have ring bells all over this room because if you have an atom and you can have a suppressor field and that field can eliminate all the graviton emissions from this side of that atom, that means we do not have any resistance to its acceleration. These gravitons are going away at sea speed, light speed. Even though it's very, very small, if you have no resistance, this atom is going to take off at the speed of light. Alright, if we go one step further then, Oops, oops, let me back up there. Wait a second. If we go one step further, we can say then let's take a spacecraft, let's have a suppressor field generator in that spacecraft. I'm sorry. Oops. I'll get this eventually. No. I'll just have to comment on that one. What's happened is if you had a suppressor fuel generator in the bow of the spacecraft and that were to generate a frequency that did eliminate those gravitons from all the atoms of the spacecraft, including the pilot, including the cargo, that spacecraft is going to take off at the speed of one light speed per second per second per second. The reason we have to have this is because when we go out in the space, we're not just wanting to go out into solar system space. We're talking about we want to go out into interstellar space. And the distances are just so great that the idea of that we are just going to be able to travel, you know, a fraction of light speed and do anything is negligible. It's laughable. There's no way. If we get out into space and we're going to travel interstellar space, we have to travel it at faster than light speeds. There's no other thing that will work. And I don't mean just one times light speed, two times light speed. I'm talking a thousand times light speed. And if we have this facility working where we can constantly keep uh, the gravitons suppressed, we can go almost anywhere at any speed. We can have another suppressor fuel generator on the back end of the spaceship. We can shut off the front one, turn on the back one, and we can make turns or not stops and go and take off again like we see certain craft do in our skies. We can do this because if we can determine, if we can block gravitons, we can determine the inertia or inertia and we can block it off. Then we come to something else. If we accelerate an atom again, and we accelerate it fast enough, we are going to pile up gravitons in like I call a little packet. Now let's assume we accelerate fast enough, we can push those gravitons together fast enough, it is possible that this packet, this frequency around this packet, 
will be able to be recorded in our rods and cones or eyes. In other words, could this be could this be a photon of light? Now, if this could be, if we can make light in this direction, that means we make light because of compressed gravitons. We have now linked together the last few items in the forces of nature in the unified theory. And by the way, that's supposed to be the uh, criteria for a real crackpot. If he comes out and says, I got a unified theory, then you're supposed to be a crackpot automatically. Okay, well, you guys got a crackpot sitting up here. All right. So it is possible then that this may be the light, how light is made. And so actually then that means that the light you see coming from an accelerating electron or whatever is exactly the same thing, the same inertia you feel when you throw a rock, only it's much, much faster acceleration. Now here is going to be a little bit controversial because it has been commented on several times tonight of uh, how energy and matter are made. Let's assume we have a dust cloud, tremendous dust cloud, and under the influences of gravity this dust cloud comes together and forms the sun. Well as it compresses, just like when you compress an automobile or a bicycle uh, air pump, you get heat. Well as you compress this dust cloud, this hydrogen cloud, into the sun, this compression li liberates a lot of heat, and we see this then as the sun that finally ignites, and we see this as sunshine, light, heat, warmth, whatever. Well, we just really changed matter into uh, some energy. Now, you haven't destroyed the matter, you just changed its aspect. So how does energy then become matter? Well. What happens here is that we have, traveling through uh, space, we have these photons of light, and we have something else here that we find on Earth, we call them uh, cosmic rays. Now, we're not talking solar cosmic rays because they are very unenergetic. We're talking about space cosmic rays, real from the cosmos. And it has been found that Years ago, they used to try to find out where these cosmic rays came from, and the further they looked, they just kept looking out millions and millions and millions of light years, and they couldn't really see any object out there that was giving off these cosmic rays. So I sat and I thought about it for a while, and I thought, well, let's assume we have a photon, and it's coming through space, and another photon, first off, sorry, if we look at, say, 10 billion light years away, we get photons that have gone that distance for that length of time before they hit our telescope camera. That means that that photon then has a, uh, call it a skin tension effect, just like you have a drop of water. The skin is made of the same stuff as the water inside, there's no difference, but because it's the boundary layer, it holds that drop of water together. So I'm assuming that these photons then, because they can last this long, is they must have uh, some sort of a, a skin effect that holds them together. If that is true, then let's assume then that over millions of years of traveling, that two photons come just, instead of going through each other like waves, all of a sudden they just match up and they make a bigger photon, a super photon. Now let's carry this a little bit further. Let's assume this happens many times. And the energy of that photon is actually getting bigger and bigger and now we already know that gravitons and so forth are going through space. Uh, and let's assume that a graviton goes through, hits this thing, and when it hits it, it must propagate. It doesn't travel with no loss of energy like it has been doing, it must actually propagate. And when it propagates, it's gonna make this a little bit denser. And if this thing is at the same, at the right energy level, that's just ready to become matter, ready to become a neutron, shall we say, and a graviton goes through it, and all of a sudden, the, the photon starts emitting gravitons from that area, and then the whole thing starts emitting gravitons. And as the shape becomes more spherical, the gravitons are being emitted, and what we have then is a neutron. Fifteen minutes later, the neutron expels an electron, and we have a hydrogen atom. So in space, where there was nothing before, 
just a bunch of radiation, all of a sudden we have a matter particle, which wasn't there before. Is this, could this be the way that we have the energy to matter, matter to energy cycle? I said 12 minutes there for the neutron, but I think it's actually supposed to be about 15. If we can build something like a suppressor fuel generator, then we can have the spacecraft with little nodes, which are suppressor fuel generators, and we can scratch the shuttle and anything to do with it because we don't need it anymore. The shuttle is our kindergarten, our, our sandbox. We are learning how to get into space we're learning what it takes, but we have to have the propulsion. Propulsion drives everything. If we don't have the propulsion, we will never get into space. And that means that your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, eventually someday are going to die on this earth and become extinct because we can't seem to hold our populations down. We can't seem to do the things we should be doing. And the earth has finite resources. We're finding that out now with oil. Uh, fortunately, we have a lot of coal in this country. It lasts us for a couple hundred years, uh, North Dakota bacon field, okay? But uh, if we can find how to build a fresh fuel generator, we will have space. Somebody mentioned the other day, or today, about uh, atoms inside the sun, you know, all being the same. Paul Duryak made a comment many, many years ago that inside a star, he thought there would be a sort of a plasma. It wouldn't be just star material like we see all the time. It would actually be a plasma. And I came to the same collection. I came to the point that if you have uh, an atom and you had special fuel generator all the way around that thing, so this thing is getting gravitons really thickly around, those gravitons are eliminating the gravitons that should be emitted. So if this thing has no gravitons to be emitted, and the gravitons are what keep an atom round and keep it so dense, it is quite possible that we would find in the cores of stars, we would find what I call substance matter. It has substance, but it has no mass. It's not giving off gravitons, it's being prevented from that. So we could have inside our star, our sun, we could have a core of plasma. And this plasma is constantly trying to reinitialize itself. It's constantly trying to give off gravitons the way it's supposed to and go back to its atomic state. Well, as the star food, the helium and the hydrogen are used up, the iron and the calcium, whatever, is it not possible that someday this core is going to reinitiate itself with a tremendous bang? And this could be the reason we have supernova. Now they hit them all while you're hitting them. All right, this got a little bit out of the sequence. Here I was showing a blob of radiant entry that's super photon. There I was showing uh, gravitons coming out, starting to emit, compressing it, and then it went into the full production of gravitons. When we talk about quantum theory, it's often said that quantum theory allows for non-casual operation, in other words, things can happen without being preceded by a cause. Einstein could not accept this, and I don't accept it either. I think everything that has a cause, and I found this quote from Socrates. It's impossible for a thing that did not before exist to exist afterwards without it having been produced and is made. I think that's a very, very good one. So I came to the conclusion that the universe, and I say universe, I say an infinite universe, not a bubble universe, not a parallel universe. This universe is all we have. And this universe, to me, is infinite. And when we talk about something like an expanding universe, we're talking about something in isolation that can be contracting, yet there's still something out there. And I come to the conclusion that the universe is a perpetual motion machine. We will never have what they call the, the death of the universe, okay, where the, the coal takes over and all you have is a bunch of empty clinkers floating around in the void. We will always see that the universe will continue to run.
this was a little item I came through. Maybe some of your physicists can look at this. I came to the conclusion that there is a constant that we haven't found yet. And that constant is what is the gravitational mass if we take a one pound earth mass and we were to eliminate nearby a black hole, for example, all the gravitons that are being emitted from this mass on one side. So this mass is accelerating at light speed toward the black hole. If the black hole actually got any stronger, this thing won't fall any faster because it's used up. It's using up all this graviton recalls already. There aren't any more there. So I came to the conclusion that if you took that one pound mass and you divided 32.2, which is feet per second of our gravity right here, and you divide it into light's velocity, you would wind up with a figure of 30.542 million. And what that is is a constant it is what any Earth mass in a 100% uh, maximum gravitational field will come to. In other words, if we were to take that same one Earth mass and we were supposed to, if we push it with a force of 30.5.542 million pounds of pressure, that we would be accelerating that thing at light speed, one second per second. Newton thought that the force of gravity overcame the fixed inertia. In other words, if you had a, an object in space, he thought gravity reached up and grabbed it. And if this was, say, whatever it could be, it had a fixed amount of inertia. And this thing overcame that fixed amount of inertia and brought it down to the Earth. Einstein thought that the, the equality between inertial mass and gravitational mass was just an amazing coincidence simple fact of nature. We now know that if the mass is falling and it's accelerating, your inertia is building up to oppose the acceleration. So we find then that the inertia then is not fixed, nor is it instantaneous. If you take, if you could push an atom side with your finger and it takes that pressure a while to get to the other side of the atom, it takes 10 to the negative 23rd seconds to do so because that's assuming light is the fastest transference of speed, that's how long it takes a beam of light to go past that atom's diameter. And so that would be the fastest maximum transfer of speed from one side to the other. So this is where we find out then that inertia is not instantaneous, as is now thought by a lot of people in science. It is a variable, and it's not fixed, okay? I'm going to bypass this one a little bit because it's a little bit involved. I was asked once if there was anything in nature that upheld my theories. And one of my theories, of course, is we can't go faster than the speed of light. Well, Quasar 3C273 is supposed to have a superluminal, faster than light jet going off to the side. And this jet is supposed to be at nine times light speed. Well, if this were true, then of course Einstein's relativity would be wrong. And so science in this country does everything to protect relativity. They'll go through any hoop they have to go through to do it. And so they come out and say, well, it's just because of this small angle right here, the Earth, and that's only, you know, this thing is going out, and we see it going this way, and it only looks like it's going faster than light. Well, the small angle to Earth argument is seen in some old astronomy books and it's still valid today. But I talked to an astronomer from, what's that, Flagstaff? Uh, I can't remember the observatory at the moment. But he told me that they had just seen, coming <clears throat> from the opposite side of the quasar, they had just seen another jet. And it was a faint jet, and that's why they never saw it before, because the light of the quasar was too bright for it. So that means then that if this thing has got another jet going in the opposite direction at the same speed as this one, the small angle to Earth explanation no longer washes at all. So uh, we can say that we can eliminate that and say, yes, we see a faster than light jet. OK. 
Cavendish, and now what I'm going to get into here is I'm going to show you an experiment which will prove this theory. And we basically, we start off with Cavendish. Cavendish back in, I think it was 1798, he took two lead, two two-inch lead balls on a beam, and then he had two eight-inch lead balls on a rope and pulley, and he brought the, the balls next to each other, oops, sorry about that. He brought the two lead balls next to each other and he measured the amount of torque on this torsion wire. And then he used the hand pulley and he moved the big balls so they were the opposite sides of the little balls. And then he measured this and he came up with the gravitational constant. Now that gravitational constant got added into Newton's formula, but I would like to remind you that the gravitational constant came about 150 years after Newton came up with his law. So rather than dirty up the waters, we're going to use this, however, to prove how this thing, if this thing works or not. Now, yes, <laughs> we did get out of sequence here a bit. I'm going to, well, I'm going to go through it all over here. These are the advantage of twisting gravity. No space, no reaction mass, faster than light. Uh, intergalactic travel is possible, no lunar bases, artificial gravity spaceship could be done, no inertial effects, low cost, completely safe. We could haul almost anything, we'd have a super lift propulsion unit. We could have a directional field if you were actually to send out your graviton beam towards something, that would act like a tractor beam just like they have in Star Trek. An ultimate defense field shield, if you were to put this shield up around you and something came through it, it would be rendered inertialess. Therefore, when it hits you, it would just stop. All right. Also, on this faster than light, we have NOVA's, NOVA 18, 1987A. We also have NOVA Persei. Nova Perseae was photographed in 1901, and it was done in September and November. And in my original uh, transparencies, I have a picture of this Nova. And this Nova looks like a mother porpoise on the first photograph, and it's got a grid, grid network on it. And then the next one, it's way over on another grid. And Percival Lowell, published this photograph in his book, Evolution of Worlds, page 13 and 14. And his comment was that this faster than light movement was obviously impossible. So, I mean, it was so obviously, but they accepted the fact that what they saw was supposedly what it was, but they would not accept the fact is that this thing was going faster than light. 1987A came out with something also faster than light, but in 1987's A case, we saw neutrinos. And the neutrino people called the people in the telescopes and told them to go aim your telescope in this direction because there's something happening. Three hours later, we saw the light in 1987A. Now recently, from CERN, they put a neutrino beam down to Grand Grassimo, I believe it's called, Grassimo, in Italy. It was about 750 kilometers, and the light beam, the neutrino beam, sorry, came 60 nanoseconds before the light beam came. 60 nanoseconds in feet is 60 feet, so that's a pretty good little chunk. Now these guys, of course, announced this year, what, about six months ago or eight months ago, maybe a year, I don't know, and the scientific community jumped all over this thing, saying, oh, no, this possibly cannot happen, you know, we can't have this because Einstein's theory will be in jeopardy. And so they finally came to the conclusion that there was a loose screw somewhere. The connection was loose. And when they found that connection, that took care of the 60 nanosecond lead time. Well, according to the guy that was ahead of this group, they spent almost two years and about 2,000 repetitions to check this thing out. And the interesting thing was, 
do you think that they would have gone through 2,000 repetitions and nobody would have gone around and checked the connections? I don't believe it. So I think what happens, our scientists merely said, right, that'll keep the wolves, you know, throw a bone through the wolves, so uh, they shut up and we'll forget about it. So now you don't hear anything about it. Sorry about that. All right. That would be kind of nice out of the whiteboard, too. <laughs> the experiment to prove this is that we take two balls, we'll call them mass one, mass one. We'll measure the force between them, and we'll call that force of one. This is all just for reference. And now we'll take Newton's law, which says the force equals mass one times mass two or the inverse square of the distance. We can forget about the inverse square of the distance, because the same in my theory. So we'll take mass one and mass two, and we'll double the size of mass two. Or in Newton, the force will then come to two. Because we double the size, we double the force. We'll leave this one double, and now we'll double the other force, and we get the same thing, only now we come out to a total of mass four, or the force of four. So with Newton's law then, we know exactly what we can get just by doubling up the masses. In this law, what's going to happen is on one of the spheres, the first sphere, see we've got mass one, mass two, uh, sorry, mass one, mass one, and one in between again. And we take one atom, and this atom represents all the atoms in that mass. And so we represent it by a little zero, and then we take an arrow, and that represents all the gravitons these atoms get from the second mass. Remember, right now, both masses are at one, and the force is at one. Over on this side, we do the same thing. We put a little zero, we call that, represents all the atoms in that sphere. One arrow represents the gravitons. Now we take and we double one of the masses. Because we doubled it, now instead of one little circle, we have two circles each one of which has one atom, one graviton from the other mass, because the other mass will stay the same. This ball of matter now is getting two times more force developed by itself than it started. Now we take and we double the other mass, or sorry, we leave the other mass the same, but now, since this one over here is doubled, this one's getting twice as many gravitons per atom. So that goes up by two. So we have a total force between the two spheres of four, whereas Newton had two. Now we continue on. This one we leave it double, and we come over to this one, we double this one. Because we double this one, now both of these over here, these two little atoms, get double the amount of gravitons. So their force is added. Okay, it's two times more than what it was. This one now has been doubled to two. So what happens again is that this one now, because it's got double the amount of atoms, receives double the amount of gravitons and also gets times two. So we come up to then a total of, starting from the finish, one, four, eight. If we do this experiment and it comes up the way I say it does, 148, which is double what Newton says, then this proves that this is how gravity works. It proves the existence and the operation of gravitons. And we should see ourselves then as saying, right, we've now proven how this works. Let's get off the stick here and let's build ourselves a spaceship. All right, I see I've had my 10 minute warning. I would like to just mention something else. Uh, wish I had another hour to go. Five minutes, all right. If my theory, my hypothesis is right, that means that Newton's law is, can be modified, but it also says that Einstein's relativity is wrong, general relativity is wrong. And I'd like to 
show an example where you can show that Einstein is wrong before I quit. And that example is taken from Einstein's book, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10, Theory of Relativity. In chapter 8, he talks about identical clocks. In chapter 9 and 10, he says, let's take a railway embankment with a guy sitting in the center, and let's have a lightning strike come down and hit, we'll say, point A, which is the one end of the railway embankment, and point B on the other end, and it hits them simultaneously. And we can say simultaneously, because this is a thought problem, and we can set our conditions. So the lightning strikes down, hits both A and B, and the guy in the middle sees both flashes at the same time, so he knows that this lightning strike was simultaneous. So then Einstein goes on and says, okay, now we're gonna have a moving reference system. We're gonna have a train. And that train is gonna have point A on it and point B at the end, okay? And it's gonna have a guy sitting in the middle. So this train is coming along, and when the two points A, both in the embankment and train line up, and the two points B line up, and the two observers line up, we get ourselves another humongous lightning strike, which hit again simultaneously, and that's our, our coup there. You know, we can specify this. And so, when it hits the guy in the embankment, again, he sees the lightning strikes both ways, right? So he sees them at the same time. The guy in the train does not know he's on a train. There's no windows, there's no clickety-clack. He thinks he's at rest. So when the lightning strikes, A and B, all right, he's gonna see the lightning strike on one side that he's traveling towards faster than he's gonna see the lightning from the other one. So he's going to assume that this lightning strike was not simultaneous. So Einstein can basically say, well, I proved my point. This thing was not simultaneous due to the moving reference system. Well, hold up a second. On chapter eight, he talked about identical clocks. So now, let's take the guy in the train, and he takes these identical clocks, and he puts one in the for point A in the train, and he puts one over in point B in the train, and we stipulate that when they get hit by lightning, they stop and hold their time. But Einstein himself said that identical clocks will stay identical on a moving reference system if they're attached to that reference system. So now the train comes rolling by. Again, everything matches up. The lightning strike goes wham, okay? And again, the guy in the train sees the guy, sees the lightning strike from the head of the train first. But he thought, aha, I put identical clocks down. So he goes down and he looks at the clocks, and what is he going to see? He's going to see the identical times. So he will know then that his perception, which was real, did not reflect reality. Because he now knows that that lightning strike was simultaneous, and he must have been moving in order to see this other light first before the other one. And if he actually does the calculations and checks it out, he can even figure out how fast he was going. So. That's just one way that you can look and say, that where Einstein says, well, I proved simultaneously, you can use the same experiment and say, no, I did not. That was completely false. Now, if I got two minutes, but there are several ways that you can actually prove Einstein wrong. Einstein's genius lay in the fact is that he got people, smart people, to accept his ideas. That's where his real genius was, and he was a genius. And Einstein had a damn good idea about how gravity worked. He had some good ideas about what should happen for light when it raised an incidence from the sun. He said it would bend. He got it right, but for the wrong reasons. The reason light bends is because you've got these gravitons coming up, the light's coming at the speed of light, the gravitons are coming straight out from the sun. So they're actually hitting these photons at a 45 degree angle. When a graviton then hits the atomic field, it must propagate. And when it propagates, just like it did, it makes a recoil. And that recoil on those photons is actually what makes that light bend. Now, I know most of you guys are used to a lot of the uh, formula and esoteric stuff, and this is pretty, pretty basic stuff. But you know, if I'm right, we can get to the stars and we could do it in 10 years. By the time 100 years goes by, we're gonna be damn glad that we had it, because I don't think we can live on this earth at present population, not present population, but the way it's increasing and the way our resources are going down. What are we doing right now in Iraq and Iran? Those are resource wars. We're fighting for oil. 
we may wind up doing the same thing in Syria and Iran. But we are going to control it. And although our government can't come out and say that's why they're doing it, that's what's happening. I'm at zero. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for listening to me. If anybody's got a question, sure. Now I'm in trouble. Maybe I missed something. Uh, can you clarify, clarify a couple of points? Uh, first one, the COR theory reproduces Newton's inverse law of gra gravitational attraction, at least uh, approximately. Right. We, we modified Newton's law by putting a 2 in front of the mass 1, mass 2. They're in quotation marks. Means, uh, that means there's a big difference. That means right? that Newton's law, the gravity is twice as great as what he thinks it is. Okay. Plus, uh, plus, we must also increase g, the gravitational constant, by double. So the actual gravity force that we deal with today is actually four times bigger than it should be, okay. that we think of it. And then there's a problem because the Newton's law is well verified. Yes. As far yes. as I know, can you explain the current uh, like orbit oh. motion? Sure. Hold on a second. The reason we can use Newton's law instead of having to have the twice figure, okay, and the gravitational constant twice, is because the Earth, in comparison to the satellite that we're using, the Earth is effectively fixed. Yes, so, right. in my experiment, if we'd have taken the spheres on one side and put a barrier so they couldn't move, they might have the force, but they can't develop it. That's why we would get then, with the same situation, we would get Newton's law for our result. We get one, two, four, as we doubled up on the spheres. But as soon as that second set of spheres is free to swing, like Cavendish never did, then we will measure the force that that second set of spheres made too. Be Newton did not know that when uh, you increase the density or uh, the mass, that not only the gravity from that mass increases, but the gravity from the other guy increases too. And Newton okay. never knew that. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay first, the second one. Does your theory suggest gravity work with infinity speed or finite speed? Well, let's look at uh, quantum theory. Quantum theory says that if you put a ripple in the water, the ripple will go forever. Okay because you're taking a little bit off and it never comes to a finite end. But in reality, you're going to come to a point where this little molecule over here is going to move so slightly that it does not affect this molecule over here. And at that time, your quantum ideas about force going out forever stops. So the same thing with gravity. Gravity is made by gravitons. And if they can travel, if a photon of light can travel 10 billion light years and more, to get to us, so can the gravity, uh, gravitons. So when a graviton hits something, it's going to make the unbalanced graviton recalls. But if the object is so big and there's only so many gravitons, very few, it's not going to make much difference. So effectively, sometime, gravity's influence will stop, even though we are in an infinite universe. So the gravi uh, gravitons you talk about uh, travel with finite speed, right? So what? The gravitons. Yep. Gravitons. Gravitons, you talk about. Yeah. The travel with the finite speed. Right? Sorry, I didn't. The, the, the particle speed. Say again. Finite speed. Uh, they have a finite. They have a finite speed, but I am going to suggest that because of black holes, we can say that uh, gravitons probably go faster than light, because in a black hole you are generating vast amounts of light. But the gravitons coming off off will hit that photon of light and they give a recoil to it. So it comes to the point that if gravity is so strong that enough photons can hit that photon of light, they can actually stop that light from going away. And this is what we see in black holes and why they're black. Okay, thank you very much. One more question and then we're going to call it. Just, just a quick one. Sure. Uh, <coughs> I have heard that the CERN repeated the uh, uh, experiment with the and have confirmed that they actually do travel faster than light. You say that again? They, they soon have repeated the experiment, uh -huh. uh, I believe, and they have confirmed that, yes, the uh, neutrinos do travel faster than light. Oh, good, good. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that, actually. Well, thank you very much. I hope you all enjoyed it. Sorry I didn't get this right, but that was my fault. That wasn't uh, Greg's. <laughs>